I want to make a couple things perfectly clear up front. I believe the presuppositional apologists featured in the series and most I have met, seen, or heard of to be Christian God-fearing men. This is not a salvific issue. Neither is this an issue of true or false doctrine, though I do point out my differences in interpretation of several scripture passages with how the precept apologist uses them herein. What this is an explanation of is why I, having initially accepted the presuppositional apologetic to be factual, particularly the Vantillian precept and or its modern application, which is the focus of this series, now see great holes in the logic and manner of its approach, and endeavor to explain these problems in this series, that the viewer may weigh the matter in their own mind. I make no pretense of being objective. I do not know that objectivity truly exists. But that in no way means that I wish to straw man the precept apologetic or show it in a slanted light. Neither does it mean that I am not considered and striven to understand exactly what the claims of presuppositionalism really are. As I said, I formally held to them for a few months and have sought out the best counter-argumentation to what I present here since then, with the aim to hopefully hear even more should this need fine-tuning. So I do believe I am familiar with Vantillian presuppositionalism and will leave it to the viewer to decide if I truly understand the claims of the argument. I make the distinction of Vantillian precept as I am far less familiar with what is termed Clarkian presuppositionalism, so I do not want to paint presuppositionalism with a broad, all-encompassing brush. But what I mean is that I am after a higher aim than mere objectivity. I am after truth as a disciple of the truth. And the series proclaims what I believe is the truth of the matter, with the aim of causing those who might feel obligated to accept this method of apologetic due to some of the weighted claims advanced by its adherents, of it being the only truly biblical and God-glorifying apologetic, to have a means to ascertain why many Bible-believing, God-glorifying Christians reject the method, at least in part, that they might decide the matter in their own minds as the Lord leads. The following is a critical discourse on Saitem Bruggenkate's documentary, How to Answer the Fool, in which he demonstrates and expounds upon his implementation of the presuppositional apologetic. On a slight aside as a fellow Dutchman, I find it my duty to make plain to those of you who continue to struggle with a man's name that his first name is simply Cy, while his complete surname is Ten Bruggenkate. Some may remember that great Christian woman of God and Holocaust survivor, Cory Ten Boom, who likewise had the surname prefix of Ten, particular to Hollanders. The prefix Ten simply means at or on or of, or to the, or towards. So Ten Boom would just refer to a family referenced by their geographical landmark location near a certain tree, as Boom means tree, while Ten Bruggenkate means, to the best of my knowledge, and I hope Cy corrects me if I'm wrong here, on or at the small farm near a certain bridge. So with that cleared up... What would you say has been the biggest surprise? What surprised you most over the last year? Um... Since, since the movie came out? I think that one of the things, it's probably a negative, but one of the surprises is, is that uh, I found about the politics within Christianity. Mm-hmm. Um, because as, as you'll notice, I mean, look at the big ministries out there who aren't supporting the film. And um, it's not like these people haven't seen the film, they've seen it, but they don't like the fact that I've used certain books in the film, or they don't like the fact that I've you know, shown other apologies doing it, you know, what I consider to be wrong. And it's not like I'm trying to bash these people over the head, but I'm hoping to lovingly kind of slide them. And I say, you know, what have we gotten that we haven't been given 1 Corinthians 4, 7? And, you know, I'm hoping that these people come to start talking about the God they actually believe in. But the thing that has really surprised me at this time is the politics within Christianity, that people have their own little kingdom. And if they have them, some whippersnapper from Canada come along, showing them that you might be doing it wrong. And rather than, you know, seek to do an apologetic that glorifies God together in union, because I want to work with these ministries, I want to get the best apologetic out there. And, and I'm a little bit surprised that, that, you know, people don't want to join forces with this. It is my hope that the following serves, at least in part, to show why it is that many Christians have not gotten on board with size presuppositional apologetic. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. You cannot know anything at all unless you start with God. Right out of the gate, in the opening seconds of the film, Sai equivocates epistemology with ontology. This will be covered in greater depth through the course of this series, but suffice it to say for now that where the logical and spiritual error occurs is in forgetting that we all come into this world needing to be saved. Even if one denies the doctrine of original sin, passages like John 3, 18-20 and Romans 3, 10-12 declare man's default position to be walking in darkness. 
none of us starts with God. So if we cannot know anything without starting with God, how did any of us come to know God that we might realize Him as the author or starting point of our reason? In an attempt to avoid this logical pitfall, the presuppositionalist first asks the unbeliever how he is able to validate his reason, all the while assuming the unbeliever's reason is valid that he might make sense or see the nonsense in his question, and then he turns around and tells him that he does know things. So you know that nobody can know anything. You know that for certain. Yes. Okay, so that's a certain knowledge claim. Now let me ask you this question. In order to come to that certain knowledge claim, are you employing your reasoning? Yes. Okay, now let me ask you this question. How do you know your reasoning about anything is valid? So if you could be wrong about everything you claim to know, it follows that you know nothing. Yes. Oh, but absolutely. the problem is you do know things. Well, I don't think so. The only well, thing I do know is that I know nothing. Do you know that? Yeah. That's two. Do you know that you're at this university? Do you know that you're studying? No. I'm dreaming. So that's right, you could be dreaming. Yeah. So without, unless you start, I can explain to you why, unless you start with God, you can't know anything at all. But you do know things. You're spending big money to be at a university to study things. The cop pulls you over and rolls down the window. You say, I don't know if you exist, sir. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pay the fine or whatever. You don't live like that. Yeah. Hang on, this guy's having a very good conversation. If you please not interrupt. Yeah, yeah, what I'm gonna say is unless you start with God, Hang on, unless you start with God, you can't know anything. Because in order to know anything at all, you would have to know everything. Because if you don't know everything, what you don't know could contradict what you think you know. But does the, the, that make sense to you? It does, but can't okay. the argument be posed in the same way uh, that you're talking about God? Well, we'll get to that in just a minute, okay? Yeah, that's, and that's and I'll be, I'm answer, glad to answer your question. Answer you're reasoning question. very well, sir. So in order to know anything, you would have to know everything, right? Or have revelation from someone who does. But the problem remains, if he cannot simply assume what we as Christians know to be his God-given reason, then he is stuck in solipsism, the philosophical theory that only the self can be proved to exist. Actually, this hard skepticism the apologist uses forces us, and I say us because none of us came to the world as Christians starting with God, into something worse than solipsism, absurdism, which is exactly where he wants to go. Problem is, if his argument holds, then there is no way out of this, and the unbeliever can never come to any knowledge at all, let alone that he must start with God in order to have knowledge. God could come down and tap him on the shoulder, and he still wouldn't know if he was awake or dreaming. And of course, no one lives this way, just as no one lives as if they had to validate their reasoning. The argument's a catch-22. Who is That's he? the Christian worldview. That's God him? has revealed truth to us in his word such that we can know it for certain. Because you know things for certain. Do you know why you know things for certain? Because you know that God exists. And that's what the Bible says. People don't go to hell for denying what they don't know. They go to hell for the sin against the God they do know. And I expose that people know God when they make knowledge claims that they can't account for without Him. Yes, this is the Christian worldview. God is the foundation for all things, including our knowledge and reason. And people deny it because man loves darkness rather than light because our deeds are evil. But we each reason to that end, even as it was revealed to us. Chop away the extreme skepticism of calling on someone to validate their reason in order to reason to this, and it would be a powerful evidential argument for God's existence. An infinite regress is only resolved in an infinite self-existent being. That's stone-cold, irrefutable logic, though of course it can be denied. But leave the extreme skepticism in, and you give the unbeliever an out for their unbelief by trying to pass over a logical argument illogically. How do you know your reasoning about anything is valid? Oh, but the absolutely. problem is you do know things. Yes, unbelievers do know things. Just to keep oneself alive takes the knowledge to feed and water oneself, to not make a habit of running down the middle of the freeway at night, etc. We must each assume our reason, that is to say, use without justifying how it, or if it works or doesn't work, to live in this world. Yet we each come into this world as or quickly become rebels of God. None of us started with God. What I'm not saying is that the ability to know things, our reason, or our very existence is somehow independent of God. It is my firm belief that He is the reason that there is something rather than nothing, life instead of non-life. He is the one in whom we live and move and have our being, for by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. But that is something we cannot escape reasoning 
two in order to turn around and realization that he is the God we couldn't reason without. We must assume and exercise our reason in order to know of God and then assume and exercise the faith he has likewise endowed to us in order to know him as Savior and Lord. Neither can be validated until they are exercised. We must assume and exercise them before we know from whence they came. This is why I say Psy has equivocated epistemology with ontology. He has conflated the knowing of our knowledge with the being of our knowledge. I will come back to this later. Let me quickly point out that I am in no way saying that truth is subjective. What is, is, regardless of any subject's particular perspective. But we must each assume our reason in order to comprehend what is real. In other words, what is truth. I can say you have certainty if you know God exists. Right. But the fact that you think God exists is based on okay, your so own reasoning. Can... The unbeliever has a point. Although as a Bible-believing Christian, I don't agree that I've reasoned God into existence, as is the underlying claim the unbeliever is getting at here, where he is correct is in that we must assume our reason in order to recognize the existence of ourselves and God himself. I was talking to a great friend of mine, and the first thing I said to him was, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. <laughs> and we were talking about six hours about this apologetic, and the light finally went on, and his eyes went wide open, and he said, I get it. They can't know anything unless they start with God. I said, man, that's the first thing I told you. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 1, 7 exegeted with Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Shows quite clearly that it is speaking of spiritual wisdom, a knowledge that flies high above any mere epistemological certainty. As I have said and is plainly obvious, the unbeliever has knowledge, just not the understanding of spiritual knowledge. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. This is the knowledge that begins with the fear of the Lord. It is not 2 plus 2 equals 4, the law of non-contradiction, which is able to be known by every reasoning mind, Christian or non-Christian. Where do you hear evidence most often? In court. Who do you give evidence to in court? The judge. The judge and the jury. So we go out in the street in a campus with some arrogant, snot-nosed kids like that, and they say, I don't believe in God. And what's the first thing we do? We give them evidence. And when we give them evidence, who are we saying is the judge? Them. them. And who is on trial? God. God. Wow. So we go out in the street and we say, you, sir, are the judge. The Lord of glory is on trial. Wow. What does Scripture say? Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And what are we doing? We're out there saying that God's on trial. There is a great difference in meaning between what Christ told the devil is recorded in Matthew 4, 7 and Luke 4, 12, and the sheerly self-serving purpose of someone challenging God to perform a miracle for miracle's sake, which could do no other than to draw praise and glory to the creature rather than to the creator, and someone giving reasons and evidence for why they believe in the living God to one who denies his existence. It is not the apologist who is putting God on trial. God has already allowed the unbeliever to suppress the truth of his existence and unrighteousness and deny him. The apologist is merely pulling back the curtain of the God denier's willful blindness and revealing what is the true state of reality. It is a complete category error to equate giving apologetic arguments and evidences to an unbeliever with putting God on trial when God himself has allowed unbelief. The trial is already in progress. In billions of chambers, which are the inner beings of creatures created in the image and likeness of their creator, within the courthouse that is this universe and temporal existence, there are individual trials in session. As Christians, we understand that the courthouse is God's, but inside the individual rooms what is being tried is not God himself, though the unbeliever may think so, but rather the individual's belief or unbelief in him. We are God's witnesses, his evidences, testifying on his behalf along with and pointing toward what he has already revealed in nature and scripture. We are exposing what the unbeliever is suppressing in order that God might use the evidence we present in conjunction with the evidence he has put inside the individual of a conscience convicting them of their own sin and move through the working of the Holy Spirit to open their eyes to the fact that they are conducting a trial that is only possible and that they are inside of his very courthouse that they might recognize that one day when they move from the temporal to the eternal and enter into the courtroom and come before the throne of Almighty God on the day of judgment, 
they might be found clothed in the righteousness of Christ rather than condemned in the rags of their own self-serving good works and sin. Incidentally, this is why the following statement is a spiritual false dichotomy. Well, I, I've got some good news for you. Nobody goes to hell for not believing in Jesus. Okay. Hallelujah, right? Do you know why people go to hell? Because of their sin. Yes, the wages of sin is death. But John 3.18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, reveals that the sin that ultimately condemns us is the sin of not believing on Christ, so that the sin debt we each rightfully owe God is paid with, by, and through his precious blood as the atoning sacrifice on the cross and victor over death when he raised from the tomb on the third day. That is the unforgivable sin spoken of in Mark 3.29, the sin of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. When we deny Christ, we cannot receive the Holy Spirit, which is the seal of the believer, and therefore we will not be forgiven our sin. So it is a false dichotomy to speak of sin and not believing in Christ because the ultimate sin, the one that ultimately condemns a man, is not believing in Christ. Now getting back to this idea that presenting evidence for God is the equivalent of putting God on trial, there is something informing this discussion that is so obvious it often gets overlooked. Presuppositional apologetics is evidence. At least that is its aim. It is an evidential argument. There is no escaping this fact. Sai's own website is called ProofThatGodExists.org Proof That God Exists You know what the proof that God exists? Oh, that big. The proof that God exists is that without Him you can't prove anything. Proof is defined as evidence sufficient to establish a thing is true or to produce belief in its truth. It is also defined as the act of testing or making trial of anything. Test, trial, to put a thing to the proof. If classical and evidential apologetics is putting God to the test or on trial, then presuppositional apologetics is also guilty of this because you are trying to offer evidence to cause the unbeliever to realize what he is suppressing in unrighteousness, namely the knowledge of God that he may then come to know God. You are trying to get the unbeliever to recognize that the proof or evidence of God is that without starting with God, he cannot prove anything which aside from being an epistemological impossibility as we have seen and will continue to explore throughout this series, is presenting an unbeliever with evidence. That's Are you saying that you believe in evolution, sir? Of course I do. Okay, Scientifically so you, proven. You believe that your thoughts are the byproduct of your evolved brain? Yes, 100%. Okay, if I got a bottle of Mountain Dew and a bottle of Dr. Pepper and I shook them up and I opened them, they would start to fizz. That fizz would be the byproduct of a chemical reaction, right? Sure. Would it make sense to call one of those fizzes true and one of those fizzes false? You see. I, I, it wouldn't make sense. You're right. You know why? Because it just is. It's brain fizz. But if our thoughts are just brain fizz, you can't call something true and false. That is a perfect example of an argument used by presuppositionalists as well as classicists and evidentialists that is a perfectly reasonable and powerful evidential argument for the existence of God. Yet it is evidential in nature, as all apologetics can only be. And it has been and must be reason too. Well, imagine somebody came up to you and said, I don't believe in words. We'd think that they were a fool. We wouldn't believe them. And we wouldn't take out our dictionary and give them evidence. But if somebody came up to you and said, I don't believe in God, we believe them. We give them evidence and we don't think they're a fool. When the Bible calls them fools, something has gone wrong. I mean, listen to, listen to the Bible verses. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. It doesn't say the heavens proclaim the glory of God if he exists. Psalm 19 speaks of natural revelation. This is God's evidence to man of his existence. Who needs evidence of God's existence? Apparently everyone, because according to Psalm 19, God has given every person on earth his evidences. This is how the visible and invisible man recognizes what Colossians 1.15 and 1 Timothy 1.17 call the invisible God. This is why Romans 1.20 reads, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What the classicist and evidentialist and yes even the presuppositionalist does is point to these already existing evidences. It is not as if we are coming up with something new. Like Kepler said about science that is like thinking God's thoughts after him, 
Sola classicists and evidentialists point toward the wonder of what God has already instilled into his creation. They are not pulling these things out of a hat. They are merely pulling back the curtain of natural man's willful blindness so that the light of who God is and must be floods in. Yet the unbeliever can still deny it, same as he can the presuppositional argument. God never gave us the option of proving him objectively. He still convicts by the Spirit and desires the faith of the individual on an individual or subjective basis. God is not a bet. He's not even a good bet. He's not even the best bet. He's the certain God that has proclaimed himself certainly. Absolutely. I absolutely affirm this. That's why I speak of the evidences, one of them being the very existence of reason, which cannot be accounted for in any real way by strictly naturalist processes. I speak of evidences just as a presuppositionalist does, evidences which point toward the God I know. Most of my life when I was defending my faith, I was doing it wrong. I was giving evidences to the unbeliever. The problem is most Christians are doing it wrong today. I mean, look at the books that we have. 20 compelling evidences that God exists. The Case for Christ. A Handbook of Christian Evidences. Evidence for God. Evidence that demands a verdict. Who's the judge in this case? Not the creator of the universe, the unbeliever. These people know that God exists, so instead of believing what the Bible says, we believe them when they say that they don't believe that God exists. We elevate them to the position of judge and we put God on trial. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Now, according to that verse, who needs proof that God exists? Nobody. Nobody. And what do we do when we go out into the world? We try and prove that God exists to people. Personally, I think it's far more logical to draw conclusions based on the evidence. That is for each of us to decide on the basis of the evidence, of course. We're just going to give you evidence and let you see where it leads. This has been drilled into our heads for so long that we believe the unbeliever over the Word of God. It's true. Giving someone the reason why I believe is not the same as believing they are somehow excused in their unbelief. I believe wholeheartedly they are without excuse. So I answer their objections in order that they might not feel justified in their unexcusable unbelief in hopes that God will in some way use me as a vessel through which to pour out the light of His truth that they might come under conviction and come to terms with what their love of sin causes them to suppress. I've seen over and over that it's actually the Vantillian presuppositional argument which causes the unbeliever to burrow further into their unbelief, smug in their summation that Christians are afraid to answer them because they won't answer them, so they assume they can answer them. And the problem is that I'm going to tell all of you this today. And tomorrow, you're going to go out and the guy's going to say, I don't believe in God. How do you know that God exists? And you're going to say, every building needs a builder. God is not a builder. God is not a builder. He's the builder. And they know it, and they're without excuse for denying it. That's the God that we believe in. And though I cannot speak for everyone who does the work of an apologist for Christianity, I have seen over and over how classicists and evidentialists ultimately point to Christ. It is just that they realize, as do many presuppositionalists, that one cannot escape arguing evidences to get from there is no evidence that God exists to a God exists, which is truthfully as far as the presuppositional argument goes on sheer logical deduction, even though I realize Van Til made the assertion that this God must needs be Trinitarian, to the God who has revealed himself through the Bible exists. Neither can it be denied that it must ultimately come down to the subject exercising their faith, no matter how strong the evidence presented or how it convicts them, in order to know this living God and be reborn in Jesus Christ by the working of the Holy Spirit. The other day I felt my heart beating in my chest and I thought to myself, 
I have a pump in my chest about the size of my fist made of meat. It pumps 700,000 gallons of blood per year and runs for 90 years on donuts. And I got to prove that God exists? Evidence for God? Look around. I don't have to give you evidence for God. You know that God exists. That's the God we have to talk about when we defend our faith. You know what the proof that God exists? No, that big. The proof that God exists is that without him you can't prove anything. Evidence to prove, to make clear in the mind, to show in such a manner that the mind can apprehend the truth or in a manner to convince it. What does a presuppositional argument do other than attempt to prove the existence of God in such a manner that the mind can apprehend and be convinced of the truth? Look at the very definition given for the word apologetics. A branch of theology that is concerned with defending or proving the truth of Christian doctrines. Are presuppositional apologetics actual apologetics? Then they too attempt to prove the truth of Christian doctrine. And if this is to be considered putting God on trial, then the presuppositionalist is doing this very thing every bit as much as the classicist or evidentialist. Now the thing is, at this point, people are saying, well, I was convinced, I was converted because of evidence. Does that mean I'm not a Christian? No one was converted because of evidence from the natural world, societal observation, or by a logic-based argument, including the presuppositional argument. However, God may use these evidences along with the evidence of one's own sin to reveal to the individual the truth of his condition and his need for salvation in, by, and through Christ. But salvation is ultimately by the grace of God, through the faith he gives man, that man exercises to believe and repent of his sin. God can save people through evidences, but I'm really afraid of people who say that they're Christians because of the evidence. Christians because of the evidence. Because if you're a Christian because of the evidence, then you're not a Christian. Again, it depends on if you are speaking of external evidences that point to God, which I agree can only lead someone as far as to give intellectual assent. And if this does not lead to true belief on Christ as Lord and Savior, then I completely agree that all that has happened is that they have become a Christian word only, a false convert. Or if one is secured by God and perseveres in God because of the evidence of the Holy Spirit that testifies of God in us that seals each of us who truly believes. But technically, as I'm sure Sai would agree, we are saved by the grace of Almighty God through exercising the faith He has given us to believe. Because you know what can happen? If you have evidences to convince you that God exists and you're a Christian because of the evidence, you're still the judge. And the problem with that is the next day you can back over your three-year-old kid who's playing in the driveway. Kill them. Now all of a sudden you've got evidence that there's no God. And the scales are going back and forth and back and forth. Ooh, now I'm not so sure that I'm a Christian anymore. I'm not so sure about that. And then you give them some more evidence. Oh, now I'm a Christian again. Then they watch a Richard Dawkins video and it's going back this way. But what's the problem? Who's holding the scale? The unbeliever. The unbeliever is judging God based on the evidence. They've never submitted and bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. I agree. If they are basing their Christianity on mere intellectual assent, then they are merely a false convert. But the presuppositional argument in and of itself can likewise get someone no further than this. Only true conviction of the Spirit and true belief can cause someone to be born again. This undeniable experience that once you've had it for real, you cannot forget or deny no matter how you try, is what sustains the believer in their faith in those moments of extreme doubt and sorrow. I say, I'm not a Christian anymore because of this evidence. Indicates they were never Christians. What do we as Christians do? We try to repair that evidence. What should we do? Not answer them? Not give them the reasons we have found to defend our faith in the place they claim to be hung up on in hopes that they too will come to saving faith in Christ? Of course, the greatest thing we can do is pray for them, that they might be granted repentance. But if I am asked what I believe, 
I will answer straightforwardly and leave the rest up to my sovereign God. They say, well, I'm not a Christian anymore because the Bible says this. Oh, let me tell you what the Bible really says here. Oh, I'm not a Christian because I don't believe that dinosaurs walk with man. Well, look, we have these fossils here, and we try and repair that evidence. And let's say you repair all of that evidence, and where do you bring them back to? A position where they weren't Christians. Congratulations. And the precept brings them not one step further to Christ. You may convince a man his worldview is reduced to absurdity without God all day. But in the morning when he wakes up, he will go right on living that absurd life unless there is an act of God and conviction and a corresponding act of belief from the individual. What you point out applies to all apologetics. I mean, you can look at our arguments. Look at the, we use the cosmological argument. Mm -hmm. Say that um, everything which begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore it must have a cause. It must be an uncaused cause, and that uncaused cause is God. We use all these books and have all these arguments to try and reason to God. We have arguments that conclude God. God is not a God that we can reason to. He's the God that we can't reason without. And herein lies the rub. How does one escape reasoning to the conclusion that God is not a God we can reason to? He is the God we cannot reason without. Is not the truth of the matter that God is the God who endowed us with reason that we then utilize in order to realize that he is the God who created all things and therefore without him there would be no reason or even existence for that matter? Why not just reason in a straight line to God and then in a straight line back to our reason rather than chasing a circular argument that is fallacious because it concludes with its premise? Why try to prove the God of logic using illogical argumentation? Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Paul in Colossians 2 says, In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Why do you think Paul told us that? He tells us in the very next verse. I tell you this so no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. What do we have? Fine-sounding arguments. This is Paul's warning to Timothy. Guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. What is false knowledge? See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. That's what we're doing. If using science and logic to demonstrate the existence of God is the equivalent of using false worldly knowledge and the vain philosophies of the world, then the precept argument is sunk in the same boat because it is asking the individual to employ their reason and logic. But I serve the God who, because his very nature is logical and reasonable, we are able to discern logic and reason. Who, because he created the heavens and the works therein, because he created the natural world and life itself, I might understand his invisible attributes, because everything in his physical creation, both form and function, serve as metaphors for spiritual truths. But look at what scripture really says in context. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Clearly, this verse is showing that there is a vain, deceptive philosophy which comes after the traditions of natural man, but there is also a philosophy which is after Christ, or the last phrase, and not after Christ, would have no meaning. What we cannot do is concede the knowledge, logic, reason, and evidence our Creator has given us simply because natural man, in his desire to deny the truth, has perverted these things after his own traditions in interpreting the rudiments or elementary principles of this world. This thought that any philosophy that is not Vantillian presuppositional in nature is vain and after the thinking of natural man and therefore not God glorifying is based on the previously covered misconceptions that we can somehow avoid employing our reason in order to understand that God is the foundation and framework of our reasoning and that presuppositionalism somehow escapes being evidential in nature. While I do believe that any philosophy that is not based on the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord, whether it markets itself as Christian or secular, is after the vain traditions of natural man, I do not dismiss all evidential and classical apologetics by failing to recognize that the vast majority of what is termed such are likewise ultimately rooted in the declaration of who the God of the universe truly is. While they may not explicitly state it, they are tools that reveal this fact when used in conjunction with Scripture. And presuppositionalism 
can get no closer than this either. I do not believe that God has put it to us to be able to give objective, undeniable proof of his existence. Some then say that this is to argue a probable God. I say is to argue the God I am certain of that deals subjectively with individuals, one individual in one moment of time, moment by moment. What's the most famous apologetic verse, 1 Peter 3.15? Always be prepared to give a defense of your faith. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you, a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. The word reason here is the Greek word logos, from where we derive our word logic, and it also has to do with spiritual truth. People always forget the beginning of that verse. But set apart Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give a defense of your faith. That's what we have to get back to. We don't conclude God, we start with God, and we show them that if you don't start with God, your worldview is absurd. I agree. The apologist must set apart Christ as Lord of his life before he begins his apologetic endeavors, or there is no way to glorify God with them. And classical and evidential apologetics do just that, demonstrating that apart from God, one is left on a foundation of absurdities, having to explain how something can come from nothing, how they can cross an infinite regress to get to the present moment of now, how life can come from non-life, how a single-celled amoeba added information to itself, how animal kinds can become other animal kinds, how metaphysics can arise from the physical through strictly naturalist processes, how random disorder can organize itself into order, i.e. what accounts for the physical laws governing nature, how supremely complex bodily systems can slowly evolve piecemeal, i.e. the very real problem of irreducible complexity, etc., etc. But what we don't do is demand they validate their reasoning so as to start with God, because if they could not assume their reasoning, just as we all assume our reasoning in order to recognize God exists, they would have no way to escape solipsism. So everything we pointed to might just be hallucination inside their heads, including us, including God. Because any God that requires me to give evidence to you is not the God of the Bible. Would it really make sense that the creator of the universe would have to give you evidence before you will bow down to him? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. But God has given us evidence. Everything in the natural world cries out in testimony to him. Our very lives as human beings, able to comprehend him, at least in part, with our minds, is evidence of him he has given us. The conscience within us, the conviction we experience in repentance itself, these are all evidences he has given us. Otherwise, how will we know to repent or to whom we ought to repent to? Scripture itself is evidence of God. When he came down from glory and walked among men, those who saw him had evidence of him. He did miracles giving evidence he was who he claimed to be. He created us to comprehend evidence. He gave us reasoning minds and faith to believe. This is just the inescapable way in which he has created us, that we might know him. 2 Timothy 2.25 In the hope that God grants them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Repentance comes before a knowledge of the truth. These people have to repent of their sin against the God they know exists for any of that to make sense. Exactly. This is exactly why demanding the unbelievers start with God makes no sense. It is completely unbiblical. How can natural man know the things of God? This is why no one who has ever used this argument on someone who has even a basic grasp on philosophy has done anything but frustrate themselves. Although done unwittingly, the reality is that the apologist is trying to subvert the order of things God has prescribed in his word. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Before submitting one's life to Christ, one uses their God-given reason. Yet one might not attribute their reason to God. One might think it comes from a vague, non-personal being, or force they might call God, or even a personal force which is not the true God, or they might attribute it to somehow having arisen through Darwinian evolution. It is only after submitting one's life to God that one understands that without God there is no foundation for one's reason. But it is futile to try to get an unbeliever who rejects the living God to accept that he needs to start with God in order to have a basis for knowledge 
because he does know things. He just doesn't know the things of the Spirit that allow him to know God and recognize him as his basis for everything, for life itself. We do not reduce an unbeliever's worldview to absurdity by calling on them to validate the reason we all must assume in order to know anything, including God, which might be a good reason for why he gave reason to us, and demand they start with God or they cannot know anything. No. This only makes them think we are claiming intellectual superiority. And if there is one thing that engenders contempt quicker than causing someone, even inadvertently, to think you are claiming they are stupid and you are smart, I don't know what it is. And yes, I know the Bible says the fool says in his heart there is no God. But the Bible also calls out many things that make a man a fool, making it clear that it is man's love of sin, the ultimate of which is denying his maker, that makes him a fool. So therefore, we are each by nature a fool. So it is only alienating and, yes, foolish to hammer that in one's argumentation as if one is themselves exempt. We recognize that all men are by nature fools and point them to the truth, who when they come to him in repentant belief, gives them his mind that they may then open eyes that were blinded to the things of God and recognize all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are hidden from natural man in him. How you expose to someone that their God-denying worldview is built on the foundation of absurdity is speaking to them as a fellow human being created in the image and likeness of Almighty God, who has been endowed with reason and asking them to account for their reason apart from Him. Do you see the difference? One is saying, Nana nana boo boo, I can validate my reason by inserting God into the vicious circle of validating my reason by my reason, and you can't. And the other is saying, hey, since we both have to assume our reason, because if we had to validate it, we couldn't escape our own heads to know if anything, including God, is real. How do you account for it, other than that a mind can only come from another mind? You may say this only brings them to deism, but again, presuppositionalism can do no better, regardless of what is asserted. It is the spiritual truth of Scripture in accordance with the working of the Spirit that moves one from a God to the God. This is why I frequently liken what the Vantillian presuppositionalist tries to accomplish to attempting to shunt spiritual truth past an unregenerate heart straight into an unrepentant mind. You see, the issue is not evidence. I completely agree with Sai here in this sense. Ultimately, the problem is one of sin, blinding oneself to God. This is what causes an unbeliever to accept inane notions for their existence. They justify this in reinterpreting the Bible to make God seem like the unjust one. They approach the evidence from a starting point that there is no evidence for God, and thus everything they see that the Christian or person on their way to Christ sees as evidence for God is filed as something else. Ultimately, the goggles we put on through which we observe the evidence is the root of either seeing the evidence as evidence of God or not. But this is why, in part one, I asked the question, is reason a presupposition, or is reason a necessary precondition for our presuppositions? If presupposition is defined as then it is an elementary assumption in one's reasoning and therefore reason has been assumed as a precondition on which one's presuppositions rest. But if reason itself is a presupposition, as it's driven at in the hard skepticism of the following exchange. So in order to know things, you're employing your sense and your reasoning, right? Said, I know there's a tree there, I know the ground is solid. I know these things to be self-evident true. You're employing your sense and your reasoning, correct? Yes. How do you know your sense and reasoning are valid? then we cannot escape our own heads in order to know anything that we might even put on the proverbial goggles in order to observe the evidence. Because, for all we know, the evidence is the figment of our imagination and therefore no evidence at all. This is the elemental problem with how the precept is being argued. As a Christian, what is the foundation of our reasoning? The foundation of our reasoning is God. Because let's face it, we believe some things that without God are nuts. I believe that a donkey talked. I believe that a snake talked. 
I believe that a man who was dead for three days came back to life. I believe that an axe head floats. Why do I believe those things? Because God is the foundation of my reasoning and he says that's true. That's why I believe it. If this was the whole of the presuppositional argument, I would be the first presuppositionalist in line. Now an unbeliever will say to you, well, I am no longer a Christian because something did not make sense to me. I say, oh, so you're the authority of your reasoning now. Yes. But as a Christian, God was the authority. Yes. See, how do you reason from the position that God is the authority to the position that he's not? Well, something didn't make sense to me. As a Christian, if there's something we don't understand, and there's lots of things in Scripture I don't understand, what are we supposed to do? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Amen. Couldn't agree more. God didn't say, validate your reasoning so you could understand that you should trust me to lead you because your reasoning and knowledge is limited. No. He says, yes, you have reasoning. I should know. I put it there. But don't be so assured in your reason and knowledge that you forget where it comes from and who you should trust in. How do you know anything? And let's take as a generic knowledge claim the letter A. How do I know A? What's the answer? Well, because of B. How do I know I'm sitting here while my eyes are telling me? How do I know my eyes are working properly? Well, I went to an eye doctor and uh, he checked them up. He gave me a good, clean bill of health. So because of C. I know A because of B because of C. How do I know C? Well, because of D. How do I know D because of E? You know where that ends? Not at the end of the alphabet. It doesn't end. It's an infinite regress. I know A because of B because of C because of D, on and on and on and on. So in order to know anything at all, you would have to have infinite knowledge. You would have to end that infinite regress. The only way to do that is with infinite knowledge. Who has infinite knowledge? I don't. You don't. Who has infinite knowledge? God has infinite knowledge. So in order to know anything at all, you would have to know everything or have a revelation from somebody who does. Was with Sai on this right up until the end. I think the term revelation is what confuses the idea. I think the correct way of stating this is, in order to know anything, you would have to know everything or be created by one who does and has instilled within the pinnacle of his creation, humanity, by virtue of creating them in his image and likeness, the mechanism, namely reason, whereby they too might know things. Otherwise, we cannot help but conflate human knowledge with spiritual truth that comes from submitting to God. That is the Christian world. But how does badgering someone to validate their reasoning when we each must assume it in order to know anything conform to the teachings of Christ? Validate the following approach biblically. Can I try to restate is, the questions in a, a different, in, in more layman's English? You could, but you've already said you could be wrong, but I think you claim to know. So really, <laughs> Again, oh, no, I'm, I'm not, only asking not, you these questions. Let's not play so that I, I'm that's concerned. Not, you're not asking me? Okay, that's fine. I'm sorry. We've got to stop <laughs> with this cheap trick of, of you could be wrong. It's old, and we need to move on. You're disrespecting Okay, thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. Get off the stage. So, I mean, basically, they were saying, hey, Sai, you can't use that argument. Stop. You know, basically, this is a powerful weapon. And they're saying, yeah. put down your powerful weapon. Put down your atomic bomb to our right. worldview. And yeah. size going. Well, you go into a discussion. They have a pea shooter. You bring a gun, and they say, "No, oh, you can't use that gun. You know that that gun is a nuisance. I don't like that gun." So what do most Christians do? They throw it away. They say, "Okay," or they give it to the unbelievers. Yes. Yeah, so say, here, you can have knowledge. You can have truth. You can have logic. You can have all these things that belong to Jesus Christ, and you can use them to argue against Jesus Christ. I will not allow that. A man might think they somehow have the power to allow or deny someone from perverting their knowledge and logic and reason to suppress the truth, and I completely understand the sentiment behind it. But God, the creator of all men, has allowed them to do so, and even told us in his word that such has been, is, and will be the case. So we know who is going to lose out on that battle of wills. And that's why I tell people, don't be a jerk about it. You know, this is, this is the example I give. I say, let's say there's a, the unbeliever is like an airplane going through the air, and you're firing holes in, that, in their worldview. That airplane is coming down. And if you're a jerk about it, they're not coming to you to talk about the gospel. They're ditching in Lake Hindu or in Lake Scientology. But you want them to come to you and, t and tell them why their worldview is absurd because they don't start with Jesus Christ. Sobering words. We'll leave it at that.